Welcome to Bed Crime Stories Podcast. I'm your host, T. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, bed crimers. As always, I wish you the best. To anyone new here, a warm welcome. Thank you for checking out my channel. Let me just ask that after listening to or watching this video, if you learned something or enjoyed it, please do me a favor and smash that like button. Now let's dig in. More information is being funneled out of the Lataw County Jail, where suspect Brian Koberger is spending his time these days. This source is describing Koberger as an imposing figure. News Nation's Ashley Banfield reported comments from a source who is said to have access to the suspect accused of taking the lives of Ethan Chapin, Zanna Kernodal, Madison Mogan, and Kaylee Gonsalves. Let me remind everyone that Koberger is presumed innocent at this time, but he is the one and only suspect in the crime and the cops believe he's their guy. So this unnamed source said that Koberger looks a lot different in person. Here's what Banfield said on her show Wednesday, and I quote, a source who has intimate knowledge of Brian Koberger in jail has told us that upon setting eyes on Koberger for the first time in person, it was a whole other image. On television, the description was that he looked like a toothpick, a skinny toothpick on TV. But the toothpick image on TV, according to this source, in person, it looks like he's well over 200 pounds and that he is quite imposing. I find this disturbing to hear because if Koberger is indeed the perpetrator, I can only imagine how the unarmed students felt seeing this large presence coming at them. But is it possible that Koberger has put on some weight, either thanks to a vegan diet in jail that likely doesn't translate into organic steamed broccoli and fried tofu, or because he is aware that to survive in the clink, he needs to bulk up and be imposing and or pay someone to be his protector. Banfield noted that Koberger currently is being held in the maximum security area of the jail, which is in the basement, and he has no neighbors. Banfield also explained that when he goes to mass on Sundays, he's allowed to sit with the other prisoners, but he can't engage with them. I'm pretty sure they don't want him engaging with them. I pictured him alone with a visiting priest. Banfield then said this, the other inmates, we're told, are very curious about Brian Koberger. They are also relieved, we are told, that he keeps his head down and hasn't made any trouble for anyone. One of the references is that Koberger is very polite, and here is a quote, he does not seem like a psychopath. Ex-inmate Larry Levine, who is also the founder of Wall Street Prison Consultants, a company that basically rich people who are going to prison engage to teach them how to survive inside, address the bit about Koberger not looking like a psychopath. Levine said this, and I quote, let's go to the fact that he doesn't appear like a psychopath. I flew on Con Air. They call it J-PATS, Justice, Prisoner, and Alien Transportation System. I was chained up next to a guy that was a serial killer. He killed like five people. I was sat next to him for like three or four hours, and this guy seemed as normal as you or I do. You really can't tell. He was really intelligent. The things he said, he admitted to me, yeah, well, I killed them and they deserved it. But he seemed level-headed. Brian Koberger is not stupid. Maybe more arrogant than anything. We also learned this week, again from News Nation, about a course that Koberger took at DeSales University his classmate Josh Ferraro, who was also studying criminal justice, described the class as follows. The course that I took stands out is psychological sleuthing, where you basically enter the mind of a killer. My professor, Catherine Ramsland, would give you sheets, and basically the sheets would denote details of a crime. However, you wouldn't know who did what per se, 
or where this was, but it was a group thing. So you would get partnered up or in groups and you would go through these activities and basically come up with a theory or a thesis and challenge to Dr. Ramsland. The Law and Crime Network correspondent Sierra Gillespie spoke to Banfield in more detail about the course and the university. Gillespie said this about DeSales University, and I quote, Koberger actually studied there for his undergraduate and his graduate degrees. He received his master's degree in criminal justice from that school. The interesting thing about DeSales is that it is known for criminal justice. So that is actually a reason why a lot of students go there because they have these world-renowned professors like Ramsland. They have a hands-on program. This is something unique to DeSales University, end quote. Yesterday, I told you guys about DeSales Crime Scene House, where students can go inside and get to experience what it's like to be crime scene investigators, or CSIs as they're called. Apparently, they also work with what Gillespie described as rudimentary DNA. The students also get to put together some clues and do interviews. So clearly, Koberger did have some hands-on experience in this type of thing before moving to Washington. It's a scary thought to consider that DeSales and Dr. Ramsland may have inadvertently been providing an education to a guy who maybe was bent on following in the footsteps of Dennis Rader, Ted Bundy, and the other notorious serialists. I have to wonder if Ramsland saw anything in Brian Koberger that sent a shiver up her spine. I mean, she's been talking to serialists for years. Surely she has some spidey sense when it comes to interacting with people. According to an article I found on Psychology Today, titled, How Can We ID the Wannabe Serial Killer, written by, get this, none other than Dr. Katherine Ramsland. She writes that there are four key signals that can alert people that someone is capable of extreme aggression. These are signs we should all be aware of. Before I get to them, let me share a story that Ramsland wrote about in the article. This real life story involves a girl named Sarah M in Germany who took a sharp object and jabbed it into a man's neck as she set out on her plan to become a serialist. At age 19, Sarah was obsessed with Ted Bundy, Jack the Ripper, and Richard Ramirez. Sarah was convinced that the uncaught Ripper had been a woman, and she used this vision of the Ripper as her role model. One day, Sarah arranged a date and asked a friend of hers to wish her luck. Apparently, Sarah had vowed to do in one lover every day, starting in May of 2021. In preparation for her plan, she bought a sharp object that is normally used for camping, and she researched the best places on the body to attack with such an object, and how long it would take to die by this method. Sick. Then she created a dating profile that she named, get this, Domina Cherry, a name deliberately designed to bait certain men. The profile was an instant hit. She hooked up with a guy right out of the gate. So this unsuspecting guy picks her up for their date, and Sarah immediately uses the sharp object on his neck. Now this man fought back, but ultimately he did not survive the blood loss. This was Sarah's first crime, and she was soon arrested for it. So much for a long career as a serialist so much for following in the footsteps of the Ripper. At her trial, she showed zero remorse. Like her hero, Richard Ramirez, she responded to her sentence by flashing a pentagram that she had had inked onto her palm. Ramsland writes in the article that she gets many requests to spell out how we can see these deadly aspirations forming in young people before they act out. Ramsland then writes, and I quote, 
we have some clues, end quote. She goes on to discuss some sources who later reported that Sarah had been diagnosed with borderline personality disorder, which, according to Ramsland, is a common diagnosis for psychopathic females. Ramsland mentions a study that looked at the prevalence of personality disorders in the clinical reports for 22 sexually homicidal male juveniles. Apparently, there are no studies for females of this ilk. Surprise, surprise. There's no way this video is getting monetized, by the way, with me using all these terms. Oh my goodness. Oh well, there's no way around it. The study found that conduct disorder, personality disorders, sexual sadism, and psychopathic traits were prevalent. The article says, and I quote, Although juvenile sexual homicide is rare, 1% of murder by minors, the combination of these conditions makes them highly dangerous. Less than 10% of these 22 juveniles had been essayed, and the most prevalent personality disorders were schizotypal, schizoid, sadistic, paranoid, and borderline. The article said, and I quote, the researchers concluded that the combined presence of psychopathic features, sexual sadism, and schizotypal disorder is a red flag for motivation to commit and repeat sexual violence. The next red flag Ramsland cites is what is called callous unemotional or CU traits. She writes, and I quote, Behaviors that show degrees of empathy and conscience are present in kids as young as two or three. Higher callous, unemotional behaviors in children are related to lower guilt and empathy, more proactive aggression, and, prospectively, to callous, unemotional traits in late childhood. Because parents pediatricians and caretakers can spot the signs, they say there's potential for timely intervention, end quote. So parents can keep an eye out for kids that display callousness, low empathy, little sense of guilt, narcissism, defiance, and deceitfulness. Sounds just like me as a kid. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. But per Ramsland, Personality traits are just part of the recipe. She said that wannabe serialists are often collectors. They collect items that help fuel their fantasies and affirm their aspirations. Ramsland shared an example of a young man who had been considering becoming a serialist since the age of 13. Wow, aim, aim big, guy. Aim big. He had a collection of knives he named himself the Red Ribbon Killer because he planned to leave red ribbons near his future victims. And he took photographs of himself as the Red Ribbon Killer, much like Dennis Rader took pictures of himself. This young man started his career with essaying young females, and he jotted down the names of each one of his victims as candidates to put on his kill list, so depraved. He was caught at age 19, thankfully, before he got to the killing part of his sick career. Clearly, if anyone sees a kid collecting weapons, along with picking a moniker like the Red Ribbon Killer, coming up with an M.O., and crafting an ID as a future serialist, this would be a major red flag. This requires very present parents, mentors, people who are keeping a close eye on their kids and what's going on in those kids' online lives. Another sign is if an adolescent becomes obsessed with specific serialists. Ramsland writes this, when this obsession occurs during the period when adolescents are forming their sense of identity, it can shape the thoughts of those with low empathy toward violence. Media coverage of killers provides role models and ideas for weapons and M.O., 
but immersion in the details of a killer's crimes can erode moral boundaries, end quote. Ramsland goes on to say that many think it's the McDonald triad, which is fire setting, animal cruelty, and bedwetting that signals a future serial killer. But per Ramsland, that's an outdated and faulty model. She writes, Today's research on kids at risk for future predatory violence focuses on disturbing developmental patterns, detached or deficient affect, the desire to inflict harm, a lack of guilt, and a strong identification with serial killers, especially specific offenders, are the primary behaviors of concern. Timely intervention is possible, end quote. Well, that's good news, right? It makes you wonder what, if anything, Brian Koberger's parents witnessed in their son when he was growing up. Until the next time on Bed Crime Stories. Hey, do me a favor. I used all the naughty words today. YouTube is not going to like this video. Smash that like button. Consider a membership. Subscribe. Yada, yada, yada. You know the whole drill. And I'll see you next time.